We are about a month, about two months from Halloween, and I figured I'd give you a horror story. One that happened in real life, one that I'm still kind of reckoning with right now, but I've kind of healed the trauma enough to tell. We're going to tell a story about contract work and why I will never do it again. I said that I would never do it again before, but now I will definitely never do it again because I lost probably $100,000, $200,000, and hundreds of hours of time. So let's talk about it. So the story begins in February. I was approached by somebody on LinkedIn, which should have been red flag number one. Nothing good ever comes from LinkedIn except for the occasional job. I was approached by somebody who actually lived in my area. They said, hey, let's meet up. I want to talk about a project that I'm going to work on. I checked him out. He seemed to have legit creds. He had some you know, a couple of patents. He had a couple of businesses that he had started. Evidently, he had sold one or two of them. And, you know, he seemed like an up and up guy. And we're going to call him Bob. Now, we're calling him Bob because that's not his real name. Because unlike Bob, I actually respect the terms of the contract that I wrote. And I'm going to stick with the NDA and all of that other fun stuff that I ended up signing, you know, when all of it started off. So we meet up at a Starbucks. He talks about this really awesome project that he wants to build out. It is a document parser built in Rust. I ended up telling him that I wanted to build it in Rust. I think that was a really good choice still. Um, and it was going to be super high tech, super in depth. And I was really excited about it because it was going to be another chance for me to work on Rust and another chance to kind of work with some technology that um, you know I had never used before. It was fairly involved, but I think that at least in the beginning, I pared down the scope fairly well. So we agreed on some scope. A couple days later, we signed a contract involving an NDA and the terms. Now, let's lay out the terms. The terms were $12,500 to be paid out on a net 30. And I'll explain what that means in a bit. Net 30 and another $12,500 to be shared out net 60. And then the big icing on the cake was 2% rev share for 18 months. Now, net 30 means that 30 days after a start of a contract, that payment is due. Net 60, 60 days after the start of the contract, that payment is due. In my contract, which I wrote up myself, may have been a mistake, but in my contract, I had explicitly the dates that that was going to be required to be paid out. So 12,500 net 30, 12,500 net 60, that was going to be how all of this was paid out. The rev share for 18 months was due basically for 18 months after the end of the contract. So after the contract was finished, that's important. We're going to come back to that later. So. It is important to recognize that neither of these two deliverables were prefaced on any kind of deliverable on my part. So it did not matter where in the project I was at, as long as I was continuously working on the project for 30 days and I was still working on the project on the day that net 30 was due, I would get paid that 12,005. As long as I was still continuously working on the project by net 60, that project was done. There was no requirements whatsoever. We agreed on that in February. 30 days later, I had gotten a ton done. We had you know, a lot of bugs. It was not finished at all, but we had a lot of bugs, but I was making great progress. I was continuously getting praise from the client and you know his coworkers as well, and the payment didn't come. I thought that was weird. Okay, well, let's continuously ping them. Let's continuously ask them for money. And I basically said, hey, um, it's been seven days now past net 30. I'm not going to work anymore until I get paid. And I, I stopped working for about, it's about a week after that. So the payment was roughly two weeks late um, by the time I actually ended up receiving it. I received it. There were a lot of hummings and hawings about why the payment was late. Um, I didn't think anything of it. Me and the client were, you know, doing very well. We were talking, you know, continuously throughout the day. And, you know, everything was going great. Now, keep in mind, I also had a full-time job. All of this was going on. So basically, I was working nights, weekends, mornings, everything. I was working hours and hours and hours on this project. It was a beefy project, lots and lots of code. So it was around this time that I made one of my biggest mistakes. One of my biggest mistakes was 
allowing the source code to enter his infrastructure. So instead of building the source code into a binary and uploading that binary onto his infrastructure, I just uploaded the source code on his infrastructure and compiled it there. Now here's why that's a problem. If your client has access to your source code, at any point in time, they can cease contact with you, run off of the source code and give it off to some other developer in India and they can continue working on it for a quarter of the price, maybe even less. So that's obviously a huge mistake and ended up being a very, very big mistake by the end of all of this. So, you know, time goes on, I continuously work um, and net 60 rolls around. Nothing, no payment. By this point in time, we had reached what any reasonable developer would consider an MVP stage, which was supposed to be where we got to by the end of the contract. Also at this point in time, he said that he was interested in potentially pursuing, you know, a, a an extended contract after this so that we could continue working on it. So in my mind, I was like, well, I don't want to kind of do anything that would damage the potential for a second contract, which meant more money, which meant more working on this awesome project, all of that. I'm just not going to bring it up aside from a couple of emails here and there. Well, 10 days, 20 days, a month, two months, three months passes and I still don't get payment. By the end of all of this, it ended up being about 100 days late, which was another massive mistake on my part, waiting 100 days, continuing to work on this project, continuing to do phone calls, continuing to do demos for customers that was never in scope at all. You know, When we first talked about this, all of a sudden, it was about 50 days in, he said, hey, we've got a demo with XYZ customer, I'm going to be showing it off, is it ready for demo? I said, well, when is his demo? And he said, uh, about three days from now. And I said, no, it's not ready. I busted my ass working on this thing for like, it was no joke, probably like 60 hours within like a, you know, three or four day time frame that I was working on this. I mean, it was brutal having to work as, as hard as I was on this project to get it ready for a demo that again was not in scope. Another huge mistake that I made was not actually sticking to the scope. The scope blew up by the end of all of this. All of a sudden I was working on infrastructure, I was working on code, I was adding new features that were not agreed upon in scope. All of this because this 2% rev share, if the client wasn't lying about the money that he was about to start making with these you know, new customers that he was demoing to, this 2% rev share was going to be a lot of money for me. Now. After about 100 days, I said, hey, look, this this is disrespectful at this point. Like at this point, you have not paid me in a long time. And it, it, and it took a lot of arm twisting just to get the first payment. So what's the deal here? And that's about when the conversation with the clients um, started to get less and less frequent. Now, all of a sudden, you know, we were talking, you know, once or twice a week instead of, you know, two or three times a day. Now all of a sudden the emails were getting more and more sparse and the only emails I was really getting were bug reports and they were angry bug reports. And when I started asking for money, the mood and the tone changed, which should have been a red flag for me. I should have recognized that as the relationship as a whole turning sour. Um, I continued working on the project again, a mistake until about the 100, 110 day mark where I said, hey, enough is enough. Pay me or I'm not going to continue working. And I stopped working on it. Um, I did not receive another email back. There were plenty of reasons that he gave prior to that about why he couldn't get me the money. A lot of them surrounded this idea of an MVP sign off. All of a sudden there was some reasoning that he gave in his email that there needed to be a sign off by his investors on the MVP for the project. Now the MVP was done. Anybody who looked at this project and saw the fact that it was actively making him money at this point because he had several MSAs that were signed during this period of time. Anybody who looked at that would have said, definitely an MVP. Definitely the scope is done. He should be paid. That rev share should have started months prior. Um, but he insisted that at any given point in time, the, uh, the, the investors were not going to agree that the MVP was done. Um, so days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and that MVP sign-off stage was never reached, according to him, and he would not pay me until we reached that point. 
When I started demanding payment and insisting that the MVP sign off was not part of the contract, I kept sending him the contract. The contract was about three or four pages long. It's not like we're talking a beefy, huge contract. It was a very simple contract. Um, and he just completely ignored it. He said, well, you know, MVP stage has not been reached yet. I'm not going to pay you according to these made up terms that I came up with. Um, and contacts east. I will never see that money. And the reason why I say that I'm probably missing out on, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars is one, the clients that he said that he had signed. Now, I don't know if he actually signed those because, you know, a lot of things that, you know, he had said previous to that were suspect at this point. Um, but if he was making as much money as he said that he was, then, you know, I, I would two percent of that easily would have been, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars over eighteen months. Um, he also started a new business the wording on that company um, very much looked like he is selling the exact same thing that I built for him. Um, and that is probably going to net him quite a bit of money if he's able to sell it at, you know, the, the price point that he was mentioning while, you know, we were talking. But what lessons can we learn here, folks? One, let's talk about lessons. Lessons. Lessons to learn. One, don't contract, okay? Now listen, I've got a bias. There are plenty of people who make tons of money freelancing and contracting. I know for a fact that a lot of the reason why I am missing out on money right now is because of my own mistakes. That's perfectly fine. The reason why I say don't contract is that I think that there are a lot of things about contract work that are explicitly going to lead to situations like this. Every freelancer and contract worker I have ever talked to has got stories of them getting screwed out of money, okay? Now, some of them continue doing fine. Some of them perfect the contract work. Some of them demand payment up front. No net 30, no net 60, immediate 60 to 75% payment up front. The rest do after the deliverable is delivered. That would have saved me a lot of pain, <laughs> quite frankly, if I demanded $25,000 up front. I probably would have done a lot better. Um, but the reason why I say don't contract is that as a contractor or a freelancer, there will always be a power disparity between you and the client. The client is always or almost always going to be part of a larger business that has more money and more time that they are able to burn in order to continue their business. You don't have that money or that time as an individual freelancer, okay? I cannot pursue this and the client probably knew that I could not pursue this because I don't have the money to pay a lawyer. Lawyers are extremely expensive. We're talking hundreds of dollars an hour just to send a nasty you know, letter their way demanding payment. I don't have that kind of money. And freelancers very frequently don't have that kind of money. They also don't have the time that it's going to take to go through the collections process. So they know at the end of the day, if they screw that contractor or that freelancer out of money, chances are, at least in America, or at least in you know the state that I live in, there's very little chance that they can actually do anything. That power disparity is important to recognize. Even if you never get screwed over, you should constantly have in the back of your head that it can happen. So let's assume that you do continue contracting. Payment up front, period. Not a, well, I really wanna win this contract, so I'm just gonna kinda cut him some slack. No, you demand at least 50% of that payment up front before any work is ever done, okay? So that that's a simple one. I don't really need to belabor that point. I would have saved myself at least $25,000 if I had actually done that. Number three, no pay, no work, immediately. My biggest mistake that I made here was I continued working past the net 30 date and way past the next 60 date, okay? I had it in my head I was going to win a secondary contract and everything was going to be great, so I'm going to cut him a little bit of slack, and I cut him months of slack. Huge mistake on my part. Do not make that mistake. The moment that that deadline is passed, stop working. Put it down, and you send one email a day saying, I'm not going to work on this until I get paid. And you continuously do that over and over and over again. Okay, You stop working the moment that a deadline is missed. Number four, protect that IP, okay? So here's one of the things that I'm going to make some guesses on. My guess 
is that because I left that source code on that server that I now obviously have no access to, now that I put that on that server, he can take that Rust source code, run off to another developer, get that developer to finish it and perfect it, okay? And pay him pennies on the dollar compared to what I would have been paid. So my mistake was that I didn't upload binaries, uplo I uploaded source code. He had the most up-to-date source code that I had available at any given point in time because I was compiling it all on his infrastructure. So you protect your intellectual property until the point that it is transferred over to them. Do not ever give them access to source code unless you've been paid. They pay for the source code. They don't pay for anything. They, they are paying for the source code, okay? So do not give them access to that source code unless you have been paid. Again, all of these lessons correspond to mistakes that I made. Do not make the same exact mistakes. Number five, do not take payment other than cash, okay? So I took the promise of a second contract as payment other than cash. In my head, I was like, okay, I can push off this cash payment a little bit longer as long as I am working towards a second contract that's worth however much money. That's not cash, that's not real, that's, that's imaginary. They also mentioned the possibility of giving me some share in the company. That is complete monopoly money. That is not worth the paper that it is printed on until they go public or are purchased. And even at that point, I'm probably not going to see a dime of it. So all of this stuff that they may offer you when they all of a sudden don't want to pay you doesn't mean anything. You take cash, period, as part of the scope. Number six, since we're talking about scope, stick to your damn scope, okay? Stick to the scope. Not a, uh, well, we should expand it this way. You say, okay, well, if you would like to expand it that way, after we are done with this contract, I can add that feature. I can debug that. My cat's trying to get on my desk right now. You know, you, you add those things after the contract is done. You don't all of a sudden decide, okay, well, let's add this feature. Now, all of a sudden, I'm doing product demos. Now, all of a sudden, we're selling this actively to customers when it's not ready. All of this random shit, okay? Don't just randomly decide to add that in after you have got specific scope within your contract. And 6.5, be very specific in your contract, okay? Specifically lay out what features are going to be there and what features are not. And if the customer tries to add something, tell them to look back at the contract. If it's not in that scope, it's not happening, period, okay? Do not give leeway here because they are going to take an inch a mile. They are going to continuously expand that scope and they are going to work you for hundreds of hours, for free, essentially. There's no point in doing that, okay? I'm telling you all of this from experience. I know that there are people who did not make the mistakes that I made and are richer because of it. I'm telling you that to me, especially now that I've been burned this hard, not worth it, period. That's about it. I've gone on for almost 20 minutes now. Um, if you look at my Twitter, um, you know, I talk a little bit, not more about it, I talk a, a little bit about it. And essentially now I've moved on. I'm not going to be doing contract work anymore. I took down my um, contracts or, or one of my contract pages. I'm just not going to do that. Um, I'm going to be building SaaS stuff. I'm going to be creating content. I'm going to be doing stuff that gives me the power instead of handing the power to somebody else and letting them screw me. Um, so if you would like to follow that journey, it's on Twitter, it's on YouTube, it's on all of those different places. Um, again, I'm not going to name and shame. I would absolutely love to. Um, but A, it's not going to get my money back. And B, to me, a contract is, it's not a sacred thing per se, but it is something that's important. And it's something that a lot of the foundations of our, that was my cat jumping. Um, a lot of the foundations of kind of the way our society works is based on respecting contracts. So for me, even though he didn't respect the basis of our contract in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to continue respecting it by not naming uh, the company or the person. Because, again, I'm not going to get my money. It, it sucks. Um, couple of comments that I foresee. One, yes, I've thought about going to a lawyer. I talked to one very brief, briefly. He basically said, you're SOL. Um, two, Yes, I know I screwed up in A, B, C, and D way. You don't have to tell me in the comments. I already know that. I've already listed those mistakes here. 
Um, three, not looking for pity. That would be kind of silly. This is YouTube. There's no pity on YouTube. Um, four, uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're not going to be any exceptions to the contract work thing. I, I might maybe 10, 15 years in the future do some contract work, but at this point I'm so burned out and so uh, angry that there's just no point in doing it. That's about it. Take it easy. Be